Hey, this is Trevor from Halifax calling in to say that I support creative control on Patreon because I think long form arts journalism is a crucial part of music culture and there's simply not enough of it out there today. Vish is a master interviewer, he lands great guests, and he has his finger on the pulse of the ever-changing music landscape, both here in Canada and abroad. For all of these reasons and many more, I think you should support Creative Control on Patreon too. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. I'm Vish's wife, and I will love him no matter what you do. And now he has me on the record saying that. Destroyer is the moniker for the esteemed songwriter and musician Dan Behar, who calls Vancouver, British Columbia home. A songwriter and musician of the highest order, Behar has been on a creative tear of late, releasing a host of wonderfully enigmatic, provocative, funny, and thoughtful albums over the last decade, including Kaput, Poison Season, and Ken. His latest wonderful pop puzzle features collaborations with John Collins and Nicholas Bragg. It's called Have We Met and was released by Merge Records and Dead Oceans Records on January 31st, 2020. Dan and I had a conversation recently about how Have We Met came to be, what some of the lyrics here might be all about, our mutual love of Bob Dylan's singing and records over the past 25 years, his working relationship with the late David Berman, his future plans, and much more. A part of the E1 Podcast Network with the support of listeners like you. Subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it. And make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash creative control. Plus in-kind support from Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton. This is the 522nd episode of Creative Control, featuring the brilliant Destroyer, with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hi, Dan. How's it going? Uh, it's going good. Good. It's nice to speak with you again. Uh, as I often do, I ask my guests, you know, where in the world are you? I, I feel like I know, but where in the world are you, Dan? I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia. Nice. How are things in Vancouver today? Kind of nice. You know, like when it when it's raining in a really dismal way and then all of a sudden, you know, the sun comes out of nowhere. It's, it's kind of like one of those days. Oh, okay. Th- yeah. That's a bit unusual for that for that city is what you're saying. Yeah, for sure. Nice. Well, it's good. It's good. To, I'm calling you from Edmonton where I live now. I didn't know you lived in Edmonton. Yeah, we moved. We moved. I've been here less than a month. We moved. Wow. How, did, is that a city that you know quite well or not at all? Well, yeah, I, yeah, pretty well, I would say. My, yeah. my wife's family is from here, so we've been coming here about once or twice a year. And then right. some job things came up and we thought, let's sure. give it a shot. I mean, you... You know me uh, best, I think, as a guy in Guelph, Ontario, and I'm not there anymore. So Very how, much so, yeah. How does that make you feel? It's pretty disoriented. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna take it's gonna take me a while to get used to you as not a, a not a Guelph person and then be an Edmonton person. It's a bit it's a bit weird. Do you do you come to Edmonton to play ever? Uh <laughs> I've I was there recently. I played like a a festival that they put on there. It was more like there's just a a ton of shows that they did in different clubs. Yeah, Uh, and it had maybe the word uptown or up and downtown in it. That's right. Yeah, like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, so I played I I played a solo show, um, and that was not that was in the last couple years. Okay, so you it's not out of the question that okay. There's two things going on. One, in a sense, I'm closer to you than I was before. I could get to Vancouver more quickly, but we're still pretty far apart. So on one hand, we're closer together. 
But on the yeah. other, you're saying it's not out of the question that I might run into you sometime in Edmonton. It's not out of the question. Yeah, in fact, it's probably. I mean, it's probably the case that I've been to Edmonton more than more than I've been to Guelph. I feel like you've played That's, Guelph twice, three times. Maybe I've, yeah. I've played Guelph two or three times. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, all this to say, if you ever want to come to Edmonton and, and need help, I can I can try to help. Yeah, for sure. Okay. More okay. more more reason now. It's a lot for me to get used to as well. But anyway, enough about enough about that. Uh, I want to say, uh, as I've said to you maybe before about the records you put out, congratulations on your latest album. This time I really mean it. No, I meant it every time. <laughs> I feel like the last time we talked, it was about... Uh, Sorry, no, that's fine. I, I know you're a little under the weather. I am I'm recovering myself. But the last time we spoke, uh, we talked about your album, Ken. And I must say, as a fan of that record, I was a bit surprised by what I thought was a somewhat muted response to what I thought was one of the greatest records I'd heard in some time. I'm getting the same feeling about Have We Met? It's just started the promo cycle, but I'm hoping people are geared up and ready for Have We Met. Are you excited about this one? I mean, um, I'm excited by the same things all the time, you know? <laughs> do you Do you, in terms of... I might be alluding to the press reception. Do you care? Mm. Do you care about that stuff at this point in your trajectory? Uh, you know, I care about really practical things like bodies and clubs. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, um, I guess you know. It's not that I don't care. I, I just want. I, you know, like I want basic survival things for myself. I'm greedy for that. So yeah. I, you know, I want people to come to the shows um, so no one loses money on us. I want, you know, if anyone is going to buy the record, if there's people left that do that, I want them to do that. You know, just the basic stuff. Practical, capitalistic kind of stuff, but, but practical, practical. capitalistic stuff. Yeah. But, you know, all within all within reason. I'm not like... I'm just really trying to maintain myself in this thing. Well, I, uh, I, I, I'm not trying to conquer, you know. And I already can feel like with this record, there's more like on the writing side or like on people covering it side. There's kind of more action, but I don't know what that actually amounts to in practical terms. Sure, yeah. sure. Uh, there were, one of the reasons I, I broached this question um, is that last <coughs> night on last night on Twitter, you're, are you familiar with the um, music journalist Carl Wilson? Yeah, I know Carl. Okay, so Carl last night on my uh, on the podcast Twitter feed was like, "Vish, do you think that people are going to embrace Have We Met with the aplomb it deserves? Because it feels like, for whatever reason, Kaput, the Destroyer album Kaput, seems to have overshadowed Dan's output over the last couple of records since Kaput, and that you know people aren't." looking past Kaput to Ken and Poison Season and, and and I didn't quite know how to answer except I said, you know, I've seen other artists go through this. Will Oldham, I think, in the mid-2000s put out three of his two or three of his greatest records and I felt the same as Carl was. Like, you know, I feel like, why aren't people talking about these more? So I guess I'm, I'm talking to you from the perspective of both a fan and someone who covers music. Like, why aren't people talking about Destroyer more? These last two, I think Ken, Ken gets in my head all the time. I, it really means a lot to me, that record. And I, I'm, this is not, you. I don't know how you can possibly comment on this other than I want you to know that feeling is out there. That uh, Oh, yeah. No, I mean, like, I'll do, I'll, do, I'll one-up Carl. I mean, guess what? There was eight records before Kaput also mm -hmm. that um, people slept on. So... <laughs> <laughs> That's a, <laughs> I, I'm I'm, bra I'm braced for it. I mean, this is like, this is like where I live. Yes. Um, I don't kind of like kind of mainstream chatter about Destroyer records is like it's really just only happened with one. You know, maybe Destroyer's Rubies had a little bit of that. Yes. Um, but I'm exp not, you know, but aside from that, it's just not. That's just not. Um. That's not really the world the band lives in. It's definitely not the world I write in. Sure. Okay. Um, and I'm also like, not to be brutal about it, but might as well. You know, I'm a middle-aged person, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's got that's got nothing to do with 
really the world in in which a record gets buzz behind it. I mean, that's yeah. just not the way it works. There's no historical precedence for that unless you have some kind of industry behind you. So I don't know. Okay. There's nothing. Surpri- there's nothing surprising in it. Well, it seems to me that the musical choices you've made seem particularly contemporary. Um, so there, there seems to me that there isn't. Uh, you're giving your your lyrics and your songs a chance to really resonate in the current contemporary landscape. I mean, I, I want to ask about that. Your musical choices on this record and the musical tone generally. Um, how would you describe the approach to this record in terms of of that stuff? Well, you know, uh, a lot of it has to do with the person I collaborated with, John Collins, and his choices. I mean, the the record was made in isolation on my end and isolation on his end and isolation when we got Nick Bragg to play guitar into his computer wherever he did it in his house. Mm. So in that sense, it's very modern sounding because I think that's how records go down these days is people hunched over their computers. And I kind of wanted it to be, you know, just like not generic sounding because I think John can't make generic sounding records, but I wanted whatever was cool to be from like the way it was mixed and the way that Nick played and the the parts like the bass that John played and like uh, the the way that sonically it was layered. But sound wise, I wanted it to sound kind of modern, you know, like made from the available air out there. I think it accomplishes that that goal. Do you obviously you relate to this sound, but do you, do you have a background in kind of more electronic music? Like, is that something that was a formative influence on you in the early days of Destroyer, or, or rather, in your early days as a music fan? I don't think so. Excepting, I remember like when everyone stopped doing rock music in nineteen ninety four. 95 and all my friends started listening to Aphex Twin and, and Wu-Tang Clan and I mean I was kind of around those sounds and I knew that was what was vital not Mott the Hoople which was what I was into mm. and so like I'm in, I was interested in that the idea for this record of steering heavy more into like sound design instead of melodic arrangement it's kind of a new thing for me but I'm into it. I'm into singing into just like drift, you know, and I also just like singing to a drum, like a simple, like, um, you know, drum machine, like a drum beat, um, things like that. I was kind of finding really enjoyable. Well, you mentioned the isolation of the creation of this record and that there were three people involved and they didn't really intersect. Is this a way you'd ever made a record before? No. Okay. So this leads me to the, the title, Have We Met?, I thought was an interesting title because the sentiment of that question is there's uncertainty, there's forgetfulness, there's rudeness. Have we met is a weird thing to say to someone. It really is. That's cool that you say that. So I'm curious if, but I, now that you were talking, so that's what I first thought. I just thought that's a funny, almost Larry Davidy <laughs> kind of title. And I thought, oh, that's funny. Dan's being funny. But then when I think about the makeup of the, how the album was made, is there some, you know, parallel between those two things? I hadn't thought about that. I just thought of how we met as like just something I'd never heard anyone say before. Oh, I mean, and that I, seemed I, <laughs> that seemed weird. Like I've never I've in my life I've never heard it said. I've heard things that like mean that, but I don't think I've ever heard someone say have we met? I say um, that too much. I've, I'm really, you say it all the time, so you're the first. I say it, well, I was known as Guelph's Larry David. I have to be Ed- Edmonton's Larry David soon. No, I'd be like, someone would be like, you know, this is my partner, Steve. And I'd be like, oh, hey, Steve, wait, have we met? And then they'd be like, yeah. And then I feel terrible because I'm like, okay. yeah. But then it's a jog. It's a memory jog. I'd say, oh, yeah, right. We were at the, the skateboard ramp, right? And then one of the, that kid broke their leg. And they'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a weird, it's both rude, yeah. but it's also an acknowledgement of like, eh. I, I kind of never thought of it in the sense of like a social play. I, I always I always think of it more of like a film noir kind of something that gets uttered uh, on a train platform covered in fog, you know? Yeah, that's um, true. And I also, I was very careful to not have um, the question mark included in the title that uh, kind of it leaves it kind of more blank you know yeah um, i noticed like that it, i don't i feel like the way it's used 
as the title in in this destroyer record is it doesn't await an answer of any kind but i don't think it's rude and i don't think it's saying that the person being addressed is forgettable it's more just like one more tip of the hat to a world being erased or um just like someone who exists in a fog uh and also just seems like old language you know like just like i said i had no real experience of having heard it said or ever or ever seen it myself i just associated it with like old movies or old books have you heard it said in old movies and old books yes okay so I'm the first person you've encountered that's actually utilized this bizarre <laughs> this expression. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I feel I feel like people say something. I don't know. I don't know what the more contemporary version of "Have We Met" is. I feel like it's "Do I Know You" or something like that, or "Are You Something or Other?" You know. Well, "Do I Know You" seems worse. Is that bad? I think that seems worse. Like that's. <laughs> That's it you. Seems, like pleasantly forward. Do I but know you? Maybe, maybe that's pretty harsh sounding, actually. But. Well, that's something you would say <laughs> if you were having like a some kind of public outburst and someone right. was trying to intervene. You would rudely say, "What? Do I know you? Leave me alone." Yeah, you're that's, right. So I, this is good. I'm glad we're having this. Sort it's of, probably more of a sign of just me not being in the world at all, so not even knowing what's the, what the right expression is or like what people say to each other. I don't even know. No, I think it's actually a fairly contemporary question because in this day and age, we interact with our machines. So it's actually, a, I think, a fairly loaded question because you feel like right. you, you feel like you know someone from their avatar, but then in reality, and you might know them really well. That might be the truest expression of themselves coming out unfiltered, it's things they would never say to you in a room with you. So then you start to wonder. Do I know this person? Have we met? Do we actually have some sort of bond? I think it's a, I think it's a really contemporary title. Okay, is that good? Are you, are you happy with this reading of things? I, I I think that's I think that's good. I mean, I like as always. I give the titles kind of like not too much thought. I liked the way the the letters looked, you know, and I liked how kind of just choppy it was. And it just seemed out of the ordinary for a destroyer title, like not typical. Yeah, I I didn't think about it too much, but I liked it from the get go. No, it's good. What about the cover image? You're on the cover with some sort of device. It looks like. Yeah, I'm holding an uh, like a Sennheiser 441. A microphone. Microphone, yeah. Now, is that the microphone you use to record your vocals? No, no, I recorded my vocals with any old um, piece of shit mic I had kicking around because I didn't think I didn't think anyone was going to hear those vocals, so I didn't think it mattered. Okay, is, is why did that image strike you as being cover worthy? Well, that one, image was constructed for the cover; it wasn't cover worthy. It was. More, <laughs> That's right. I assume there was. Uh, I meant there was probably a shoot, and there was a few options, and that one. Oh, know, I knew I was. I wanted to be holding a mic. I wanted it to be front and center. I'm. I know that I like the mic, uh, that mic, mm. uh, I like the sound of it, and obviously I like the look of it, and it's pretty classic looking, and it stands out. It's this weird rectangular mic, spaceship looking. Have, um, you, have you seen um, Bob Dylan recently, or did you see him when he was on Letterman? He He's doing stuff with microphones that I find fascinating. Did you see any? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, no. Okay. He's also using kind of large uh Condenser mics, I guess. Um, is that a, that's a condenser mic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he's using these large in a live setting. He'll use these rather large, obtrusive microphones, and he kind of uses it. It seems more like a weighty. It's not like a fifty-eight where it fits in your hand. You gotta have to really mean what you're saying. It's. I don't know if I'm putting. It just seems substantive that he's Does using. He hold it. Sometimes he kind of cradles it. It's on a stand. He doesn't hold it, right. I don't think. But he'll he'll really it's hard to hold. Yeah, I, but he'll really grab onto it. I recommend if you can, if you have the time and you have the interest, find his appearance on Letterman, and you'll see what I'm talking about because it's magical. I'll check it out. Is he? Is it because he's still knee deep in um, Sinatra world, so he's singing into these old fancy microphones? I would I would venture to guess that's the case. But I also mm-hmm. think you know about your vocals on this record. Uh, and some of your phrasing actually quite remind me of of, of him uh, of late, and I wanted to ask you about that because there's something about his phrasing 
since around time out of mind, uh, where the there's sort of minimally precise language. Sometimes there's like a mouthful of sentences that he gets off, but it's that he gets through, you know. But it's usually like a couple of things, and the images really are stark, and his vocals are really high in the mix, and it's all very kind of bluntly delivered. And there's moments on Have We Met where I'm like, Is Dan? I know you like him, but I, I, maybe I'm reading too much into that. You like Bob Dylan, right? Yes. Right. So, are do are you a particular fan of say 1997 to now, Bob Dylan? Uh, I'm a big fan of a record called uh, Tempest. Ah, which yes. Was his last. Uh, that was a big one for me. Um, 2012. That is the angriest record he's ever released. I would say. I mean, he sounds demented on it, and I can't say that I would take on that vocal style as an influence. But um, you know, like the vocals were recorded first. That they were the very first thing that happened. They they didn't change throughout the recording of throughout the making of the record, while everything else like kind of swirled around and became unrecognizable or just like really recognizable. They are kind of like kind of like this one very in your face thing down the middle that allowed the music to be whatever the music kind of felt like, and that's kind of. Um, it's kind of a Dylan style, you know, like he has some of his more recent records. It seems like, you know, 50% of the music is just bleed into his vocal mic. Yeah, he does everything you know, live, live in the studio. You know, the band's like huddled around him in a semicircle and like half of the half of what you hear from the band just seems to be what that giant microphone of his is picking up when yeah. he's not singing. Yeah. And I like I like that sound a lot. The idea of trying to replicate that sound on a record that's kind of completely digital, like partly composed on iPads, just MIDI beats, um, just mostly bass and drums, you know, as the focus with like sound effects and like swirling synths. It's hard to it's hard to figure out what like sonically the comparison would be, but no, I think it's th- okay. I, this this is very heartening to me, just because I had a theory. You're kind of substantiating it. Yeah, I mean, when I take an influence from if if I'm influenced by Dylan's, basically, it, it's definitely like Dylan of the last twenty five years, you know. Yeah, his singing and phrasing is is I think at its peak. I, that's how I feel about it. I'm selfish because it's the era I've been most immersed in. It's when I yeah. started seeing him play live, and I've seen him play live a lot. But th- I just hear it in this particular record, and and I mean, there's obvious. I mean, I think people assume. When someone like you says they like Bob Dylan, it's a lyrical thing. Um, it's your way. Yeah, it's mostly it's mostly a singing thing for me. Yeah, and that's what I'm hearing. Okay, good. So once again, I'm correct. I, I'm mm-hmm. ha- happy about that. I'm picking up on you're stuff. hot. On, you're hot on the trail of this record. <laughs> I did this the last time with Ken. We really dug into it. I hope that's okay. I'm like a PI. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm like a noir. Private investigator. Yeah, yeah, this is like you should just be. This should just be you talking into your um, dictaphone or whatever, <laughs> or like your thing for recording your surveillance notes. I will say, at first glance, I thought you were holding a dictaphone on the cover. No, no, because no, I've, I've it's a it's for singing into. That's fair. I just I, I've only you have to appreciate that thus far. I've not had the re- I don't have the record yet. So I've only right. seen the image small, and I thought, is he holding? And I zoomed in recently, and I was like, oh, no, it's a mic. But anyway. I wanted it to be an action shop, but they were just too hideous. Like, they were too, my mouth was too hard on the eyes, like, uh, <laughs> close up like that, mid, mid song, you know, mid word being sung. Um, but it was supposed to be me in the act of singing, you know? Yeah. Well, I want to ask you about a couple of things <laughs> that I've noticed on the record, other things I've noticed on the record. Um I, I I can't help but wonder about commitment. There are a couple of moments on this record where the song seems to make a statement and then immediately retracts the statement. On Crimson Tide, I was like the laziest river, a vulture predisposed to eating off floors. No, wait, I take it back. I take that back. I was more like an ocean stuck inside hospital corridors. On the Raven, just look at the world around you. Actually, no, don't look. What's going on there, Dan? Is that indecisiveness? That's that's a funny and interesting thing to me that you're like, I'm going to say a thing and then immediately retract it. Is that legal? Is it your lawyers tell you to do this? Why are you doing this? Um, 
I feel like as I, I feel like there's a bunch of songs. I feel like this Destroyer songs to the years feature retractions <laughs> and like mid mid sentence denials, you know, or turning your back on what you've just said. That's a big. That's always been a big thing in okay. in the world of of these songs. You know, I, I I assume this because I know that that first line from Crimson Tide was probably written in two thousand nine. You know, like I I, I have. I can't think of the songs because I don't think about the songs, but I'm certain that, you know, that the last 15 years, 20 years has to be littered with that kind of stuff. Okay. It, okay. Is, it is a big, it's like one of my favorite genres to write into is like the retraction. Is it is it a meta device? How would you, now that I've broached it, how would you kind of, if you could step back and... You say that this might be something you've employed many times and might be on every record in the last 15 years, perhaps. What does that say about you? Is that is that just a thing you think is uh, amusing? Is it is it something about the intent of what you're saying that you want to kind of, eh, I'm just going to hedge my bets on a thing I just said? Well, what's going on I, there psychologically? I don't I don't know. I mean, I, I don't analyze the writing. It just comes to me, uh, and it comes to me in forms that I, I dig. It allows you to say more than one thing kind of at once, uh, and it allows you to say things that um, contradict each other in a very obvious way. It allows you to um, exist in a world where maybe outside forces are forcing you to say one thing when you mean another. Yeah, and that and that means something. Um, I I don't know. It seems like it seems like easy shorthand for I don't know just for like all for the world you know like for the things that we constantly do and that we think and like for how easy it is to do also the ease of it well you seem to be in some ways a purveyor of misdirection like when i think about that aspect of what you're doing on the song q synthesizer you're calling for instruments to play that are either already playing or else don't respond to your demands does that make sense? Do you know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying, but I've never really thought of what do you call that in um, in movies where the music corresponds to the action corresponds to the action in the movie? Oh, um, so like Bugs Bunny's tiptoeing through the snow, and there's like a, a like a xylophone that makes like little tiptoeing through the snow sounds. Yeah, there is a name for that, but I don't. There's a word for it, and I can't remember what it is. Right, but I don't, I didn't see Q synthesizer totally in that light where um, I say the word synthesizer and then all of a sudden there's a synthesizer solo or I say the word guitar and there's a guitar solo or drum and then drums there's a drum solo and fake drums there's a fake drum solo but I, it was more just like um, <laughs> I, I did I, I did want to somehow in very basic terms make the act of making a song seem somehow sinister or menacing or manipulative just because the second half of the song is just obviously someone lashing out at the world or someone who's just had it you know like uh someone who's had it with the world is just spitting at it but you, you can't i don't know i kind of wanted um i wanted the first half of the song to have the singer um be complicit in what is terrible in the world and I, I had the idea of what is terrible in the world is this, this this music and how how it's made. Really? So the the very music that might be playing behind you is something you disdain, or or are you referring to music like the music? Because you the the elements that you call for are there. I think uh, it's not that I, I don't think it's not the synthesizer or the guitar, or the drums. It's more like the stage direction. You know, the cue this, bring in that enter this it's more like a you know like anytime there's like a master of ceremonies or kind of like a ringmaster or something like that yeah. that character is can't help but exist in a kind of a kind of dark light or like perhaps sinister light you know well you okay yeah that's fair like as you're speaking i, I you seem to be i know you're very interested in film uh we've talked about that before i think you've talked about that with others um particularly I know you, you, we have already talked about noir, but you're getting into um, sort of media media speak here. When you're talking media speak, I was thinking just like like more more just 
how we see these characters in the world, you know, it's kind of to me the ringmaster at circus or like the um, the master of ceremonies in the like um, variety show or whatever mm-hmm. is always just something. There's always something kind of manipulative and um, just like I don't know, like kind of just dark to, to that character. And that was like a character I wanted to sing from. No, but yeah, and I I, I can I can appreciate what you're saying there, but I do feel like there's. When you think of Q synthesizer, that's a director or a producer usually making that call. You've got a, sh- uh, a, a song here called the Television Music Supervisor, uh, who regrets something that they've done. <laughs> so there's something about the artificial landscape of media, and television seems to be well. Like, now that you talk about Q synthesizer, like that to me is like somebody producing or directing a live broadcast. That's when you would most likely say Q synthesize, you know, Q drums, Q. So there's something about the power dynamic going on between the people in charge of this artifice and your interest in them. Again, I, I don't know if it's completely disdainful or if I'm making a leap here, but was is any of that swimming around in these songs? Well, I don't know. You know, I just love stage direction. I've always loved it. I, I love to read it. Um, the stuff that's in parentheses, you know. I just like that kind of language. And I, I think it it comes instantly, instantly loaded with things like what maybe you're saying, and it's very handy for that as like a songwriter to just like. Inst- I think it kind of very quickly creates a mood, especially when you stick it in someone's mouth. Yeah, no, no, it's that's fair. Um, Q synthesizer. As far as the, oh, go the ahead. television music supervisor goes, I mean, I think, I think they're pretty different songs, you know. And, and the other thing about Q synthesizer is like, uh, as a like the the music that accompanies it is insane. Like, so much of what the song means has to be just what that lyric is in contrast with the music itself, because the music itself is, um, I mean, it's not like something I know of in Destroyer and other Destroyer records. Yeah, television music supervisor is kind of the opposite. You know, it's kind of this, dreamy smear of um of, of bleeps and bloops and stuff um yeah you know a- i picture i picture very much like it's supposed to be from like a person of great power on their deathbed or their sick bed which is another thing another like kind of genre that i like a lot and i like to write from um this someone told me it seemed more like a horror story which i also really i like the idea of that because te- the television music supervisor kind of sounds like um I always thought in my head of it being kind of like Victorian sounding, but in a lot of ways it sounds a bit like a like a Kafka short story or something, which you know, kind of bureaucratic but somehow menacing. Yeah, like the bureaucratic thing is kind of where I'm leaning here. There, there seem to be jobs that people have on these on these songs. Like right. the, 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 even the, even the television music supervisor is lamenting about my famous novelist brother, Shithead Number One and Shithead Number Two. That's a job. Uh-huh. That's a job in culture. So I just feel like somewhere you're you're dealing with cultural work and what it means and where the power dynamics lie. Yeah, may, maybe. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's possible. You know me. I always want to just be like gazing upon, upon a leaf or something like that and <laughs> describing it in its purest terms. That yeah. to me is like what you aspire to. So to be writing critiques of um, cultural workers. Is uh, is is not my game, but it probably is. Probably it's probably you know swimming in my head somewhere. Well, speaking of <laughs> of media productions and jobs, the grand old Opry of Death is breathless. Uh, that is from the Raven, I believe. Is that from that song? Yeah. The grand old Opry of Death is breathless. I what does that mean? I don't mean to say what does that mean because that's a really weird question to ask someone. But at the same time, Dan, what does that mean? I mean, I'm. I mean, that's just like something from my unconscious. You know, that's just an image. The Grand Ole Opry, which means some very specific things in terms of American culture. Mm. And and then you stick of death at the end of it, and all of a sudden it means a couple more things. And then you say that the whole thing is breathless, uh, which is for some reason a word that I was really into for a while, a few years back. That line's old. And I remember looking at the couple pages around it, and there's all these breathless words all over it. 
Um, for those who haven't heard the song, you say breathless three times at least after initially saying it. It's a, That's a film noir word, isn't it? Breathless? Breathless? There's a movie called Breathless? Yeah. I don't know if I was thinking about it. I was thinking just of, of the word breath, you know? Mm. Um, mm. A lot, But... I don't know. It's kind of like a dark but uh, beautiful ghost ghost image, um, or in my mind, that's kind of what I was going for. Well, what you what you sing here eventually is that's what I'll write about when I write about the Raven. What is the Raven? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I you have no idea what the Raven is. <laughs> I mean, the title of that song. Is- it's this thing I say over and over. Yeah, you just like words, I think. I know that it's the title of an Edgar Allan Poe poem. Well, yes, we all and, a lot of And I know it's yeah. a, a bird that you can see uh, out in nature. Right. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I've, I feel like it's, in, in the song, it's supposed to represent um, some kind of, Maybe like the joke I just made earlier about me, uh, the idea of I don't want to I don't want to be writing about um, communication studies. I want to be you know writing about how the light hits the water, or you know like just like the leaf. You know that's like what you aspire to in writing in, yeah. in art, I guess. Yeah. Maybe it's that, but I always fall short of that and end up writing about other things. And the Raven is kind of like the most personal song kind of kind of modest song it's really just if you want to know the kind of stuff that goes through my head when i go on a long walk you know it's just like listen to that song and then at the end of it it's like you know these are some of the things i'm going to tackle when i write my masterpiece you know it'll all be in there but then you don't write your masterpiece you just have the shopping list right right and maybe that's that list is as close as you get well, the Raven has a line on it that kind of resonated with me as a parent. Just look at the world around you. Actually, no, don't look. I, I know we talked about this already a little bit, but I know you're a dad. Is that a is that a dad line? Is that dad rock, Dan? Mm. No, no, that's not something I would tell my daughter. Okay. No. You 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 want her? I I, I just. I struggle sometimes with like we stop listening to the news right. on the radio during the dinner times because I'm like yeah, I can't I don't want to be explaining all of this right now, and it's as you know the news tends to start with the lead is always not good, uh, it's the bad news first uh, the worst news possible first, so uh, there is part of me that has that protective thing going on that I'm starting to slowly let go of at least with my eight year old I have a five year old too anyway it just reminded me of that feeling I have like yeah the world's amazing let's explore it let's go outside actually uh, you don't need to see everything you know what I mean right but you don't, you uh, don't that didn't that's not where you were coming from I don't think so hmm. no I mean I the, just look at the world around you is like aside, aside from what it might literally mean is kind of an expression that gets used like you know open your eyes or hmm. You would use it maybe in an argument with someone, like before you lead into one of your main arguments. Just like, just look at the world around you. Exhibit A, exhibit B. Right. Most of that song, The Raven, is just like, like a pep talk, or just like ode to me and my friends, you know, or like the way you are in the world. We're just like, fuck it, who cares? Yeah, yeah. You know, the mo- to me, a, a really important line that sums up the song is. Um, the one about how good it feels to be drunk on the field again. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's like how good it feels to be like drunk in battle or to, th- to throw the game, you know? Like I love the idea of, you know, throwing throwing the game, throwing it on purpose, taking a dive, getting wasted instead of doing your job, stuff like that. Are you, are you generally someone that's into self-sabotage? I don't call that self-sabotage. It's more like it's... It's more like um, refusing that term, you know? Oh, okay. Yeah, it, I think the song is all about refusing the idea that those things are self-sabotage. It's more like I'm into sabotage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you view this, it might be, the externally it might be viewed as self-sabotage. You just think that's good old-fashioned sabotage. Yeah, good old-fashioned sabotage. Okay, okay. Make it so everyone loses, <laughs> not just yourself. <laughs> One of the, there's a lot of, I think, forgive me if I am reading humor uh, into certain things. No, no, that's good. That's good. 
I, I think, think as like as I be, you know like as a full on middle aged person now, I think the humor is really um, seeping out in in the songs. There's a song on the first song I believe on the record is called Crimson Tide. Yeah. Which if you Google it, I was like, there can't just be that just can't be named after the submarine movie. So I Googled it. It seems to be named after the sub well, I mean there's nothing else with that name. Where did you get the name Crimson Tide? I mean, in my mind, the two most famous things that are Crimson Tide uh, related are maybe there's three, you know. In the States, I think Crimson Tide is most famous for a, a really famous college football team. Uh, maybe it's the University of Alabama or something. Oh, yeah, Legendary that's right. Team, Crimson yeah. Tide. Yeah. Crimson Tide, the submarine movie. Uh, but I think I was also thinking about end of the world kind of stuff or like red, you know, like red tide, you know, where you can't go in the water. There's mm-hmm. some kind of, it's like this idea of the water being poison and maybe just like a kind of blood on the horizon or, you know, just like some kind of oncoming menace or like bloodshed. Well, I mean, the title notwithstanding, there is a, a lyric and a delivery here <laughs> on that song. That I, it makes me laugh out loud every time I hear it. It's when you say you're saying a few things at the, and then you end the things that you're saying with "I know how to blow bubbles," and there's something about that pause that I can't help but chuckle at every time. How did you arrive at "I know how to blow bubbles"? Um, <laughs> Sorry, it's a very specific question. Well, but when I, it's like a. It's like a rhyming thing, right? Blue rhymes with go, and I think I'm saying things like that. Um, I know when to hold them. I know when I know to leave. That one, of, yeah. one of the main things that people, uh, like say, for instance, my daughter, um, likes to make fun of the fact that, uh, especially since she learned when she, you know, she was five or six maybe, is like, I can't blow bubbles when I'm chewing gum, you know? Uh-huh. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to do it. And I, I like the idea of just bragging in a song about stuff that I can do when it's actually a complete lie and I can't do it but it's there in the song forever so there's no one there's no one to like basically shut it down you know like what I say goes um, also like how, how how petty it is that it's given the opportunity to create some myth about yourself um, the myth you choose to create is that you can blow bubbles when in fact in real life you can't blow bubbles it's so fascinating to hear you say this because the way you say bubbles on the song could not sound more deflated and defeated. Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't see it that way at all. But, I mean, maybe that's the delivery. I mean, it's supposed to be a list, a, a, a bragging list of things that sounds pathetic, you know? Like, it's, you know, I'm, what is it? I'm starting off with that line from The Gambler. It's like I yeah, the Kenny Rogers song. Yeah. Like, and it just kind of goes downhill from there. Um <laughs> Sorry. It is kind of like air being let out of it, out of like a balloon or something like that. Yeah. Well, there's just a lot of, as always, like there's just things on a Destroyer record that make me laugh, and there's so many of them on here, and I, I hesitate to enumerate them all because <laughs> they might be things that you didn't even intend to be funny. But yeah, there's just little lyric. There's a song called "It Just Doesn't Happen," for example. Yeah, and it that's has supposed to be a funny, kind of a funny song, I think. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, the things that stuck out, to, well, when you say you cast a poisonous look to the sun, I mean, that's uh, that seems heavy, but it also seems like heavy in a soap opera way, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's supposed to be definitely like me describing all the things that a tortured, mm, tortured poet does Yeah, when they're pretending that they think that no one's watching, you know? Uh, when in fact they know that they are casting something, they're like you know striking some kind of pose. Right. Okay. All right. Well, that that that's that struck me as being interesting. It also that song has a reference to, it has a reference to a platter song called "Smoke Gets in Your Eyes," and it also has a reference to "High Water Everywhere" by Charlie Patton and Bob Dylan. Um, so Bob Dylan had a song called "High Water" for Charlie yeah, Patton. Yeah, that's that, that's the one I was thinking of. Was that that Bob Dylan song? That's like off love and theft, right? It's right. Like high water everywhere. Yeah. So, yeah, I, was, that's, I think that's the one I was referencing. Now, what, what, what possessed you to reference that particular song in that moment? <laughs> uh, I mean, I just, I, I wrote that song real fast um, in a very like unthinking kind of way. just like this ditty, you know, mm-hmm. and I got to the line about they play your favorite songs and out of nowhere, I just started listing them. And the first one was a primal scream song called She's Just Too Dark to Care. And 
I don't know, high water everywhere rhymes with that. <laughs> and and then the last one, smoke gets in your eyes, just seemed like a nice uh, denouement to the list or whatever. It also seemed like the kind of classic song that you'd be hearing, you know, um, at last call somewhere in some in some bar or in some pl- uh, undisclosed undisclosed place in some at some time over the last eighty years or whatever. I don't know. The list came fast. I didn't think about it okay. very, very much. Part of it had to do just with rhyming. You know? Well, it's it, it may it may have inspired my question about Bob Dylan's last twenty five years earlier. I'm hearing that phrasing thing that we discussed the way he sings, but then you actually allude to a song he wrote. Um, which yeah, I love it, that one. That that album, come on! I think Love and Theft is the greatest album. Myself, it's one of my favorites. Yeah, I gotta say, I I I I don't. I'm not very successful at like recommending it, but um, yeah, it's, I agree. I, I, yeah. I, I go through I go through pretty deep deep listening phases with it. I don't know. I go back and forth with Dylan. Like it's always a wrestling match with him. You know. If you want, I can send you my master's thesis about love and theft. Oh my god! What have you done? <laughs> I, wrote, I, mean, I wrote it in two thousand two. The record came out on nine eleven two thousand one, and then I was like, you know what? There's a lot going on here. I'm going to try to write about it. I didn't even. I didn't hear it till much later. I think I. It wasn't till like uh, probably after like after Ruby's came out when I was like still really in a Dylan phase that I started listening to his like old man records. Well, I think they're great. I really, they're among my favorites. Yeah, I'm really into them now. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, okay. So we've done, uh, I've kind of cherry picked some lyrical questions and musical questions. There's a sinister vibe, I think, to some of have we met. Uh, I feel there's some paranoia and, or reality, like that that line between paranoia or reality really came up for me in that song University Hill, which has lines like, when they come to round us up, the game is rigged in every direction. Like, there's just a lot of stuff going on, and I don't, I know you're like, I don't know, I just came up with it, so I don't want to, I don't want to. No, I mean, that song, that, that song, every, every verse seems to be just explicitly uh, talking about camps, like being put into camps, like death camps or internment camps. Yeah, uh, that's all it is. It's like a love song, kind of a love song written in a death camp, and then for some reason, out of nowhere, the, it it kind of turns into like this uh, high school pep rally in the end. But that's the part of the song that took me by surprise. You know, I was just looking for something, basically a rhyming something that rhymed with thrill, and I, I came up with University Hill, which is like a high school here in Vancouver and kind of in the area where I grew up as a little kid. And mm. I just kind of came up with that refrain, you know, but for the most part, it's like, it's, it's, it's cards are on the table. That's long. Well, I, I guess where I'm coming from with it, and I appreciate that insight into that one. Um, I don't want to, I said, I cherry pick some things in this, throughout this conversation or after this conversation. And I know you've had others probably like this one about the record. Um, do you have a kind of perspective on, Maybe our perspectives on the record so far, like is is is, is any of my commentary here or question line of questioning, has it given you some some insight into what you've done or how it's being perceived? I suppose, like, do you, do you have a take on this record yet? I mean, my take on it is mostly musical. You know, the writing stuff is I don't generally have a take on that, and when I if I get one, it usually comes f- from far away. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I feel like m- musically. I don't know. I feel like musically, it's kind of uh, kind of joyous in its way. Even though we were set out to make like a really stark record and something kind of abrasive, as per usual, when John and I get together, things get more poppy than planned. So you know, most most of how I think about it is in musical terms or sonic terms. You know? mm, okay. Well, I, it's a wonderful record, if I might say, and I. I I just want to congratulate you. congratulate you again, and, and and thank you, Dan. I'm glad you make these <laughs> records, if that makes any Good. sense. Yeah, yeah. You and I have bonded a little bit over the last few years over our uh, mutual association with uh, David Berman. Um, I first of all, how are you doing since we've lost David? It's been difficult for me, but how how are you doing? I don't know. Uh, it's something I think about. You know, still once in a while. Yeah. 
Uh, you, the last time you were on, you made some, you, you weren't that candid, but you suggested you'd done some work together and on a record that ended up not happening. What did you make of the Purple Mountains record uh, that, that he ended up making? I dug it. I was into it. It took me a little while, but I think it's a really classy record. And I kind of understand looking at the writing in its completed state, like things that he was going for that maybe I didn't quite get or I just kind of disagreed with, you know, when we were first working on stuff. Yeah. No, but I like it. Is there any crossover content-wise between what you guys did together and what ended up being on Purple Mountains? Any lyrics or, or musical yeah. arrangements? Yeah, there are. Of course, are. yeah, yeah. There's songs that are pretty much the same song. About, I mean, there's like two or th- maybe t- two, two or three songs maybe, and then there's a lot of like kind of exquisite corpse. Or what do you call it when like something that was used to be a verse in one song ends up in a cor- as like a chorus in another song? You know, like a lot of things kind of swapped out. I don't think that's juxtaposition, but maybe. Anyway, yeah. A a lot of the writing is, um, a lot of the writing I knew, but it it would be like ordered differently or in different forms, like stuff that was in one song ended up in another, that kind of stuff. So you say it's a, a classy record and you say you can kind of see where and why he might have, uh, switched to a different approach on some level, but... Is that what gave you pause in terms of wanting to listen to it? Like, I was involved in this thing and then it went a different way. Oh, it's... I hope not. I mean, I just spent a lot of time with a lot of those words and melodies, you know? So, I was really... I know. I was kind of really attached to the the record that we made. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not being a baby about it. Well, how many, how many, roughly, roughly how many songs did you guys actually record in the end? I mean, the thing is like the, it wasn't done. Like, you know, he's, he's unhappy with the words. They weren't done. And it's crazy for someone who, who works like that to not have the lyric sheet etched in stone, even though part of our experiment was to try and make a record without the lyrics as in stone, you know, but I think also in the end, the music didn't really speak to him. Okay. And so you, th- there's a, ch- so you, I didn't really recognize that. I assumed the recordings were scrapped, but you have them somewhere. Someone has these recordings. Sure. And so we may, it doesn't sound like David wanted them out in the world. He scrapped them, but some, at some point maybe we'll hear them. I mean, that's got nothing to do with me. Yeah. Uh, and you know, he's someone who's, incredibly careful about everything that he put into the world. Yeah. So I don't know the idea of putting them out uh, solely on the basis uh, that they exist. Uh, you know, that's going to be someone else's call. Yeah. And I, some, something that I don't think anyone is really ready to even think about that stuff. I yeah. think yeah. most people close to him are still just, um, I, I, they're still just grieving, you know? Yeah, and I am too. I don't really want to hear it. Up until uh, the end of December, I had not listened to the Purple Rounds record since we lost David. I couldn't do it. Couldn't put it on. Um, so that's just where I'm coming from. Yeah, I, I put on. I try to put on Silver G's once in a while. I find it, I've, I've always found it very comforting music. Yes, I was gonna. Um, I was gonna say that's what I went to, and I listened to yeah. it nonstop. For some reason, the Silver Juice stuff I could do it, but the Purple Mounds thing I found it too difficult. Yeah, yeah, I so, get it. Yeah. So, anyway, I appreciate um, the last time David and I interacted was over email. It wasn't particularly significant, other than we were exchanging some theories and messages and things like that. Do you actually have any recollection of your your last significant interaction with him? Oh, I, you know, it's always just. I would have to look back. You know, yeah, yeah. I kind of remember it. But. Yeah. Anyway, I don't mean to dwell on it too much. I, I it's a commiseration thing more than anything. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I'm not really fishing. I just I, I'm trying to think of all the happy interactions we had, where he's sending me wild uh, <laughs> theories about us being in an alternate universe because of a musician that has been erased from existence. Uh, you know, stuff yeah. like that. I just thought that's that was the, that's that's the bulk of it. You know, it's yeah. always wild good stuff yeah i agree well what about you in terms of future plans um are you working towards a a, another batch of songs already and i know you've got tour dates coming up but are you thinking about what's next for destroyer no not at all i'm completely blank you know i don't think i've 
I can't imagine writing anything. I'm actually just excited to, uh, I'm excited to play these songs. They existed in such a strange space Yeah. from the time that they were written and the way they were recorded and just the way the record sounds. It's like, it feels strange to be in a room with a band uh, playing them and s- singing them. And I'm the novelty of it is very strong. And I'm currently, you know, I'm really into that. So kind of riding that feeling right now. Okay, cool. That's cool. So if people want to learn more about this record, I assume mergerecords.com is one place to go. Anywhere else you would send them? Are you, I feel like, did you join Instagram last year? There is a destroyer Instagram page. I don't really know exactly what it consists of what it consists of but um or how informative it is about anything <laughs> but um who who is managing that page if i might ask oh that's kind of mysterious okay um but it's definitely not you uh <laughs> <laughs> enough said perhaps yeah okay. i mean i'm i'm not on there okay um I don't know. Yeah, they can go to Merge Records. They can go to um, Dead Oceans Records if they live outside of North America. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. And I don't know. We'll um, look out for like an old shitty tour bus. Yep. Cruising okay. through town. Yeah. Perhaps in Edmonton, Alberta? Uh, not in the near future, but hopefully some point. Okay. I might have to come to Vancouver to see this. I might. I might do it. Why not? Do it as close. Fly over those mountains. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I might do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, before we go, Dan, is it possible for you to select a song from Have We Met that I can play for people right now so they can hear something about what we've, you know, get a sense of what we've been talking about? Sure. I, I generally pick Kind of Dark just because that's the one that is closest to the original idea of the record. So maybe play the, the track two. Okay. Is there anything about the, the sentiment of the song that you want to elaborate upon or anything you want to say about it? Um, you know, this is kind of like um, creepy, minimal, loud drums, uh, excruciating Nick Bragg guitar at the end. Just like I, I like the I like the extremity of the song. A little bit of dialogue in the lyrics, as I recall. Yeah, the lyrics are weird. They're all just like kind of these kind of slight nightmare scenarios. Three verses of them, hmm. uh, but still, you know, the song wants to be somehow catchy. Okay, <laughs> okay. This is uh, Kind of Dark by Destroyer from uh, Have We Met. Uh, Dan, thank you so much again for your time and for being on the show. I hope you enjoyed it, and best of luck in the future. Thank you. The Boston Strangler Calling all cars The palace has a moss problem It glows in the dawn Light goes wherever you go Sewn into your hem First us versus not a goddamn thing Then the blind bitch versus the clucking in a ring around the razor's edge kind of dark in here she says kind of dark in here she says kind of dark in here she says Dark in here, she says.
Very special thanks again, and as always, to Dan Behar, also known as Destroyer, for reappearing on this show. I've lost track of how many times Dan has been on this show, and it means a lot every time he appears on on this show. And what is this show? Well, this, in fact, was the 522nd episode of the Creative Control Podcast Extravaganza, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available on all iOS and Android platforms and on all, on things like Spotify and YouTube and Audio Boom and, and other things as well. Now, if you can't find an episode that you're looking for because you've heard about it and you can't find it on any of those things, or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my semi-regularly scheduled newsletter, please visit my website, vishkana.com. You can like Creative Control with Vishkana on Facebook, follow the show on Twitter at vishcreative, or follow me directly at vishkana. Also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to keep this podcast going. And again, if you donate $6 or more a month, then you have access to an exclusive audio archive. I've been posting things here and there, and I will be posting another thing shortly as we speak. So again, if you'd like to get in on that stuff, extra content, go to patreon.com slash creative control. Thanks, as always, to uh, Pete's Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, and Granddad's Donuts uh, for their in-kind support of this show. As always, my dear friend Jim Guthrie loans me some music, and I, in turn, thank him at this point in the show. But I also ask you to visit jimguthrie.org to learn more about Jim's amazing uh, catalog of music. He is one in a million. jimguthrie.org again so there that's it that's all i have to say thank you very much for listening to this show subscribing to the podcast asking your friends and telling your friends maybe to even consider spending some time with the show that all means a lot and there will be more shows coming so i hope you will check those out as well i will talk to you very soon goodbye for now